Hey, everybody, and welcome to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. And if you are like me over the last couple of years, one of the main things that you have missed with COVID and with cutbacks and all of that is travel or dreaming of travel, the tantalizing opportunity of a big trip, just so close, so possibly close. And that's where beautiful books come in, right? They can take us away to another time and another place in a blink. And I am so excited to introduce one that took me to Japan and on a journey that I absolutely loved. It is called Fault Lines. And the author is Emily Itami. And she is joining us all the way from the UK. So Emily, thank you so much for joining me and um, across time zones and across oceans and everything else. And uh, congratulations, I should have said initially, this is your first novel and it is absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you very, very much for having me. And thank you so much for reading. I'm so excited that you read it. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, talk to me about where this began for you. As I understand it, your background is as a travel writer, which is also a dream job. Hello. Um, <laughs> But your life has taken you um, living in Japan and in the UK, and you are a mom, and there's a lot of these elements that are finding their way into the pages here. But I, I mean, I just, your prose is out of this world. So I'm just really want to encourage everybody who's listening and who's watching this to pick up this book because it is beautiful. So where did the idea first conceive of? How many years has this been kind of in the back of your mind? Um, well, I guess that I started thinking about it when um, I was living in Tokyo, which was when my uh, kids were very small. Um, we kind of went over to Tokyo initially when I was on maternity leave with my second kid, which seemed like a good time to go. So I had two kids under the age of three. Um, and as I'm sure that anyone who has kids will know, that's a time when suddenly your entire life has just um, been really quickly decimated and taken away from you. <laughs> Um, so that was definitely a moment when a lot of things started kind of going around in my head. Um, and being in Tokyo was an amazing, amazing experience. Um, but I suppose it kind of um, exacerbated all the kind of things that I was thinking about at that time, because it's quite a it's, a, it's still a relatively kind of traditional society. Um, so, you know, gender roles and things is something that um, you're, you're kind of made to think about a lot when you're there. Um, so I suppose that was kind of the breeding ground for the idea. And it was kind of swimming around in my head for a couple of years before I started it, when I came back to the UK. Major changes happen when we slide into motherhood, as as you've said, and in an, another country where where yes, there, it is even more rigid. Um, it would be an incredible challenge. The challenges, the confines, the frustrations are very apparent right from the jump when we start this book, and we, I personally, fall in love with Mizuki. <laughs> Uh, our heroine, our, 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 our lady that we are following, who is a, a proper Tokyo wife and mother, but like you, she's lived elsewhere. She's lived in the States and she's, had, you know, more worldly and she feels, explain where we first meet her and, and her relationship to the balconies in these be this beautiful apartment that um, I just was like, I need to see this apartment. I need to be there. This is top of my list of where I need to go. And I'm going to go outside and scream. So I, I think you, you've said everything. So you said so much about her right at the beginning that I'm like, okay, I, I know her. I'm glad that you feel that way, although maybe I'm not glad for you, given the situation that she's in. Um, yeah, because she is thinking about throwing herself off the balcony. Um, but I, I think that I would, you know, that, that maybe makes it sound like quite a, possibly a darker kind of situation than yeah. it is. It's not that it's not dark, but I guess it's more that that act was a physical manifestation of something that I imagine quite a lot of us have, which is, as you said, a kind of a screaming inside our own heads, right? It's kind of, it's going okay, but we need to hold it together. And sometimes it's hard to hold it together, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, well, I, that was, just, maybe it's not for I you. Thought she's got a flair for the drama. And so I, I'm all in on however she's going to navigate her life because just the, it, it, it's, it's, it's comic, it's comical, it's completely relatable. And she's unafraid to have this internal dialogue that we all have, but she's taking it to the extreme. You know, maybe I'm, I'm just going to stick a leg over. Maybe I'll just come out here and scream. And she's also rebellious. So she's, she's, she's um, almost like a rebellious teen in some ways, because she's clearly pushing back on the expectations of sliding into 
um, the role of the proper Tokyo housewife? Uh, yes, she I, she is definitely um, she's definitely not that happy with that idea, is she? I, I agree. Um, I think that I um, I kind of wanted to write her that way because. I mean, I don't know, but it seems to me that it seems unlikely that anyone who looks as perfect as some people appear to look from the outside, that that, that can be, you know, everything that's going on inside their head. I mean, I, I, this is just an assumption on my part, but I suppose I, <laughs> when I was thinking about her, I was walking around Tokyo looking at all of these like incredible, perfect kind of mothers and thinking, I get, maybe it was to make myself feel better that I was imagining a dialogue in their head that was as screwy as the dialogue that's going on in my head where I'm constantly going I'm about to mess this up this is a disaster I can't believe this is happening keep smiling I think that we all do that to some extent right <laughs> I just I was completely enraptured by her and everything about her from I mean you know the, the the description of the way she looks and what she's interested in to how she navigates when she's out in socializing or meeting the other mothers or getting together and getting to be herself with some of the outings that she has and you know, that put her out in in, in fashion spaces um, so how how much did that time in Tokyo shape you and and I mean, to me, it's always seems like an otherworldly destination. And so I have always found myself gravitating towards um, books, film, art that, that depicts it. So it was, it, was a, it was a fantastic journey for me to um, have a, a more realistic sort of, you know, women's fiction perspective of this magical place. Um, I'm, I'm really, you should totally check, check it out and go there. It's very cool. Um, it's, I think that it has a, well, cause I grew up in Tokyo, so I lived there. I spent my childhood there and it was the first place that I thought of as being my home essentially. Um, so when I went back there as an adult, I had this really interesting sense that I knew it really well and that I was coming home, but, um, I also obviously was rediscovering it because when I lived there, I'd been a child. So I was having really different experiences and it was kind of fun because to some extent, because I was there with my children who were so young, I was, um, I was living Tokyo exactly the way that I had lived it when I myself was a child, which was brilliant, possibly, you know, less brilliant for my children than it was for me. I don't know. Um, but then also finding out about Tokyo, you know, as a grown up, both the fantastic things about it, you know, how, how kind of creative it is, how much, there is to do how much kind of opportunity and interesting stuff. I mean, it's just a completely crazy place, but also I suppose the things that you might not immediately, that I suppose I didn't realize as a child, the kind of cultural differences and the norms that are very different to the way things are in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, talk through a little bit, give a, give a teaser for, for those who have not read the book yet, as they would be listening to this about the, how would how you would characterize Mizuki's marriage and what happens when she runs into Kiyoshi, a an enticing, interesting stranger? What this stirs up for her? Um, I think that Mizuki's marriage to Kiyoshi, uh, it's it's not that it's any worse than any other marriage, which is something that she herself is very aware of. She's in a situation where her children are little. Her husband is working completely crazy hours, which is a very normal thing in Tokyo. And I mean, you know, the hours they work in Tokyo, they are truly insane. Death by overwork is like a kind of, you know, it's a thing that's kind of, um, I think, not as common as it used to be, but it's still not an unheard of thing. So it's truly working hours that are not really um, possible. Uh, and so, you know, she's left very much alone with her kids. And I think she's in that place where she feels like she's kind of losing her mind. Um, but I always kind of feel that it's not really the fault of either one of them. They're kind of both the victims of circumstance. Um, I didn't intend to, and I, I hope I didn't end up um, portraying Tatsu as her husband, as someone who was particularly at fault. You know, he, he's in a really difficult situation where he's trying to do what's right in terms of work and society and everything that's expected of him. And he loves his children. You know, they're all kind of doing their best, but they're in this impossible position. Um, and then Mizuki one night, on a rare night that she gets to go out, meets Kiyoshi, as you said, this kind of handsome, successful restauranter. Um, and she doesn't intend to fall into a relationship with him. I think that the thing that she really loves in her in the initial relationship that she has with him is just that he sees her as a person. He sees her not as a mother or as a wife, but as who she was before all of this role was foisted on her. And I think she realizes that she'd forgotten who she was before all of that. And it's just completely intoxicating to, to rediscover herself as well as to have this relationship. 
Yeah, it's like rediscovering everything and having that. There, there is something, and I enjoy reading fiction about it because it's so relatable. There's something that happens at a, a stage in your life where everything seems set in stone and it seems like there's no fluidity, there's no opportunity, there's no chance. And you may be very fortunate in your circumstances, but there's still something ultimately kind of stifling about the fact that maybe nothing's ever going to change. <laughs> And so she is, uh, she is, is drawn in by the possibility of just shaking things up in any way. Yeah, I totally, exactly. And I think that she's really aware, exactly as you say, you know, it's not that, it's not that she's not really fortunate. She, and she is aware of the fact that, I mean, there's a kind of arguably massively like first world problem. She's in her beautiful apartment. She's got her beautiful children. And that's why I guess all of the narrative kind of has to take place inside her head because she's aware of the fact that there is not anyone that she can tell about this without just sounding like a massive winch bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is um when you sit down to write this I mean obviously there's so many theme- themes to be touching on and it's the cultural expectations it's beauty expectations it's it's also um you know life the vibrancy of a city and and what 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 you get out of feeding off of that and then you know kind of being separated from it i mean it's kind of an ivory tower thing where she's in this space and she she knows what's going on in the streets but she's so removed from it and it is kind of you know missing that energy um but there's a fragility to the story and to her life because as she's playing with mixing things up or shaking things up which i it brings us to kind of the, the title and, and and what what a theme I assumed is running through, which is how quickly things can be can change dramatically. I mean, literally the ground right underneath you. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose if you I guess particularly I was going to say particularly when you have children, but I don't think that's quite fair because you know, regardless of children, we are aware of the fact that things are uh, very fragile and that at any moment, you know, that I mean, that's the whole problem of life, right? That we kind of go around and we're making plans and the only thing that we can do, the only way that we can live is by pretending that things are holding and things are solid because otherwise you really can't put one foot in front of the other. Um, but at the same time, we have to hold the reality of it that that we have no idea what could happen second to second. And I think, um, again, for me, Tokyo was a great place to set a story where you know, she was kind of aware of that situation because because of the madness of the fact that, yeah, I mean, Tokyo is waiting for this enormous earthquake and has been waiting for a really long time. And my memory of living there is uh, definitely that every time there was an earthquake, even a small one, everyone was afraid. Everyone's always afraid. Is this going to be the one that carries on? Mm -hmm. And to have that hanging over you, it's fundamentally a different way of living that every, when I first got there, I just couldn't get used to the fact that I'd walk underneath, you know, like motorway bridges. And as I walked, I was afraid in a way that I would never be in a place that, that you know, in, in London where that's not a consideration. Mm-hmm. Maybe I related to it most because I'm from Southern California. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. it must be the like same thing. Yeah, right. And when you have one, then afterwards you're, you know, very, very nervous and, and walking on eggshells. But it's it's that concept too with, with human nature that you know you can do one thing that causes a ripple effect and a reverberation through your entire world, at least your family or your marriage or um, everything that that you've got going on kind of smoothly. And she's, I feel she's dancing with how how far she can shake without destroying. Yes, I agree. And she's always you know, it, it is exactly, you're afraid you want to take the step because you kind of want to screw it all up, but you know that you really don't want to do that as well because it would be a terrible idea. And, you know, you might set off with one intention, but you don't know. And you know as well that if you let it go, and if you put too much into it, the situation can run away far out of your control, right? And you yeah. don't want that to happen either. It's a dangerous game, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, Emily, tell me about how you, when you decided that you were going to write this novel and how it has been different sitting down to write fiction from what you had been writing in the past. I I just imagine, I feel like every reader really has a dream of becoming an author. And it seems the scariest thing in the world, especially if you love books and you read a lot of good books, you sit down and I just can't imagine knowing where to begin. Yeah, you're so right. It's really true, isn't it? And uh, I think that you know, you have a picture in your head of how you want it to be. And then you read what's on the page and you're like, mm, I mean, it's really not quite measuring up. That's, that's the experience I think of, of, of writing. Um, the thing that I really enjoyed about it though, was the fact that 
um, the thing that I write about, I love about travel writing was just the experience of trying to pin to the page a place that I loved so much with all of its atmospheres and details and color and everything, you know, and as you said, especially, I, I actually, I didn't write the majority of it during the pandemic, but with the sensation of, of not being able to go places and of really mm. missing some places and wanting to go there, it was, it was really lovely to be able to, to, to kind of write myself back to Tokyo by writing this um, and imagining all the places that I missed that I wanted to go and think of those places and then just get Kiyoshi and Mizuki to have a really great time there. And, and it, I really loved writing it. It was, it was brilliant. And I felt like I had, a, I, I, you do, I guess, have a lot more freedom when you um, write fiction uh, than you do when you're writing, you know, uh, articles and things like that, which oh, yeah. is wonderful and terrifying at the same time. Like, you know. <laughs> You can go as long as you want. You can take as long as you want until until then. This is a huge success, and then they start saying, "Okay, now you have to have your next novel done by <laughs> <laughs> right away, right away, right." So, um, did you? How did you? How do you? When you sit down to write, I like to hear about what what how your process was. You obviously knew where you were going to be, and you had your themes based upon what your life experience had been. Do you? You have children. Um, how do you leave the house to write? Do you have to be in a certain place to write? Do you hide it, hide somewhere? Do you, you know, is there, you always have to have a hot tea? Maybe you have beer. I don't know. What do you do? Um, I think that, um, it's not quite the way that I imagined that it would be, you know, like in my dreams, I'd have like a lovely desk and a beautiful view and it would be really calm. And I'd kind of sit down at the, at, at the same time, which is something that I hear that you should always sit down at the same time. But the reality of it is, that I'm running ads, I'm sure, you know, is the case for all moms everywhere, is that you're running around between um, between taking the kids to school, going to work, and doing all those kind of things uh, that are already contributing to a completely crazy time. So writing often takes place, for me, for this book, parts of it were, you know, written kind of, I would be crouched at the bottom of the stairs trying to write something that I just thought of while the children were run, running up and down screaming or whatever. And I'd be like, okay, I've got 15 minutes and I managed to get that down. Um, so it was a kind of a combination of those kind of moments, which were not really very relaxing, obviously, uh, kind of a desperate attempt to get something down with um, some stretches of time, you know, when they were at school, say, when I was able to um, find anywhere in the house, really the kitchen table, like the sofa, wherever I could sit uh, and spend more protracted periods of time putting it together. So not as all as I would wish it to be. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's got to be such an, an incredible process. And then then to let it go and to see it here, you know, in in real life. And I mean, the cover is so beautiful. And also the audio is phenomenal. So what does it feel like now putting this out into the universe? Amazing. Totally amazing. <laughs> that's such a, I'm sorry, that's such a boring answer. That is the truth. It's like, it's totally surreal and amazing. And I hate it when people say that because I would always hear, listen to people saying that and think that's such an insufficient answer. I somehow want you to give me more detail, but that is that it feels completely unbelievable in a brilliant, oh, brilliant way. Yeah, it's got to feel profoundly personal as well. You're creating fiction, but I mean, this is just, this is your, your, your creative soul being poured into a novel. And then it's like, you know, having somebody like say, oh, you know, evaluate your child and how they look or whatever. I mean, you just, you're like, wait a second. No, you're not allowed. only I'm allowed to do that. Um, so is there, is there a, a, a nervousness involved in it? Or do you just, it is so, it's such a beautiful book and that I feel like, you know, even as, as writing it yourself, you'd have to be able to detach and say, I can, I can, I can send this, this baby out on its own. Oh, I wish it was like that. Um, no, I mean, it's, um, it's, I think that I've massively, massively detached from it. Like, you know, not in a bad way, but I just had yeah. to be totally okay with it, which is actually the opposite of the person that I am. Like naturally, I think I'm pretty freaked out about every, every single comment, you know, I'm not very thick skinned, but I guess there came a point as well when I really decided that I wanted to get this published that I realized that that wasn't going to work. Like I would have to just be okay with it and let it go and, and not let it affect me. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a teacher as well. And the thing that scared me the most was the idea of my students finding out about it <laughs> or, you know, that kind of jazz. And that's happened now already. And the world didn't cave in and like nothing terrible happened. And my students still think that I'm, you know, annoying or whatever it is they think of me. So, so nothing take change too much. So it was okay. So now that they've seen it, the rest of the world is okay. 
And uh, what do you teach? What ages are you teaching? Adults, teach kids? No, I, I teach kids. Teach uh, ten to thirteen year olds English. Oh, oh, that's a tricky age. <laughs> Fun, but yeah. <laughs> What is your advice to people who do aspire to sit down and write and they feel that they have, whether it's a character or a moment or a place or a feeling that they think is relatable and and could be something? How do they start? Oh, my goodness. Um, It's such a good question. I feel like I'm so unqualified to answer it. I think that, you know, that's what everyone always says. And it's so annoying. But I think the only thing you can do is just keep going. I mean, in the face of all odds and also keep going because, because it's what you want to do. Keep going because you, you love to write. I think that's, Mm -hmm. that's the conclusion that I had to come to after, you know, because it's, it's a very, it's so difficult. Mm -hmm. So you have to believe that you're doing it because you love to do it because it's giving you something. And, Mm -hmm. and I think that if you start from there, then you can only win, right? Because you're getting something out of it. Wow. With the story, And what was happening kind of start to finish with her? Did you know where she was going as soon as you sat down? Was this, were were you outlining this and you knew how this would, how this would end for all or, or was it um, a fluid path? Um, I actually wrote the very last line uh, almost at the very beginning of the whole book. So I always knew that that was what was going to happen. And my favorite kinds of books are books you know, I mean, I love a book with a really twisty, plotty storyline, but I also really love a book where the storyline is not, you know, it, it kind of, it, it, the arc is not that complex. It's not that it's not complex, you know, it kind of is quite straightforward and simple. Um, and I, it, the, I think that the story has been said that it's, it's the Brief Encounter in Tokyo. Brief Encounter is like one of my favorite films ever. I mean, it's really straightforward, right? It's a, it's a really simple one thing that happens and could happen in the life of anyone. It's a kind of a universal situation. And it really appealed to me to write something like that. So mm-hmm. it was quite straightforward. I knew from the beginning the way that it was going to be. It was just the question of how everyone was going to get there. Mm-hmm. And I enjoy books like that as well that, I mean, you would kind of describe as quiet, um, which allow you to really immerse yourself in the people and the moment and, and the senses that are involved and um, the, the subtleties of it. And, and so I just, um, I absolutely, I, I loved it so much. I want to ask you if, you can think of a time there are, we always think of writers being naturally readers first, falling in love with books, falling in love with going on a journey that somebody has created for them to take them away in some way or feel something that is new to them. When did that happen for you? Oh, um, it's weird, isn't it? Cause it's something that I felt like all my life. So to try and remember exactly the moment when it was first a thing, um, I mean, it's such a classic book that I wish I could say say something more original, but the the truth is I remember that when I was a kid, um, I didn't want to read, you know, when I was a very young kid and I kind of was very reluctant and everything. And then for some reason I came across Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I just remember reading it late at night under the covers with the torch. I mean, such a cliche, but that is actually what happened. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. It's just letters, but I can be in this whole other place. And it was just like a brilliant light bulb moment. It was so good. Oh, and and the, the, those, I mean, the classics, books like that, that are that magical and fantastical, they do that. I mean, they do that. But so my son's a reluctant reader and um, he finally has started to fall for books, but it's only with the flashlight in bed when he's supposed to be sleeping. And it's like, well, I'm not going to tell you to turn it off because thank God you're reading. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's just, it's, 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 uh, it's, I love, I love hearing that. It's very exciting. I, and I, I should have asked you ahead of time, but is there a small passage or, or a little bit of the book that you would be willing to read that you enjoy reading? Because I just, it's hard to communicate to anybody, just, I think how beautiful the sound of this book is. And to be honest, I'm going to say, I was, I, I looked you up right away when I, when I read this, I was able to um, listen to it first on NetGalley. And I assumed it was a translation from Japanese. Like I love reading Murakami and I just, I felt, I assumed, I thought, oh, I wish I could speak to this author, but obviously she writes in Japanese and she probably doesn't speak English. I mean, it was just, so to me, I mean, it's, it's my ignorance here, but that's, I think the ultimate compliment because it, it felt that much of a, of a transport. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. (laughs) Um, And hang on, I will try and, yes, I I think I can definitely find a, a, 
Okay, sorry, that was a terrible moment when I got too close to the camera. Um, <laughs> let me try and find a bit. Uh, something like a, a page or so, would that be good? Sure. Yeah, okay, hang on. Um, uh, okay, I think I might read it right from the beginning. Is that okay? Yes, please. Not the very beginning, like a, like a page or so in. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay, right. Uh, ready? As okay. an advert on Tokyo Metro reminded me the other day, life's what you make it. It was advertising a washing powder that can make you float in a white shift dress across a blue sky. Or possibly it was an advert for anti-constipation medicine or life insurance. It's hard to tell. <laughs> I'm always at my most open-minded, not to say emotionally susceptible on the Metro. It's the lurking possibility of death by earthquake that does it. It doesn't make me feel any calmer that the Namboku line is the deepest in Tokyo. I have no idea whether this makes it more or less likely that in the event of an earthquake, all the walls would cave in and have never been able to get a clear answer about it out of anyone. I realize that to be a diehard inhabitant of the city, you're expected to smile demurely in the face of the almighty fault line that runs straight through it and place complete trust in whatever dinky gates we've come up with to protect ourselves. But there's this unshakable image of a 10 meter tsunami wall being totaled by a wave that flashes through my mind every time I'm hurtling through an underground tunnel in a metal tin. She just has such a wry sense of humor. And I just, I love being, I love being in her head. So it was, it was a total blast. And it's, I hope that many, many, many readers find um, this book and that, and whatever work you have coming next. Do you already have a book that you are writing? Uh, yes, I do. I, I have another book that I am writing right now. Um, it's weird, isn't it? It's quite a difficult, it's quite a, uh, it's weird to talk about it when it's not done yet, but I'm writing it. And it's really uh, fun to write. Uh, I'm enjoying it. So it's a story about sisters. So it'll be, it's not a continuation of it, but it's kind of, um, it's a bit Japanese again. Uh -huh. <sighs> Well, thank you so very much uh, for, for joining us today and being able to uh, talk all the way um, from uh, another part of the world and transporting me to another part of the world as well. It was um, a really a fantastic journey. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's time for a moment with Margaret because I recorded my interview with Emily Itami out of the home studio because mm -hmm. it's a challenge to figure out the Arizona, which technically right now are Pacific time, with people who are in the UK. <laughs> Was she in the UK? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the, I mean, time zones, even East Coast to West Coast, just my mind is really insecure about making sure that I understand what zone is what and when. And so then you throw like the whole ocean in between and it's other level. So she was uh, very lovely to speak to and had the adorable accent. And um, but it was nice to talk to her. I mean, it's always great to talk to a first time novelist, especially mm -hmm. um, about their new first baby book. Yes. And I thought it was a really beautiful read. I, I don't want to concern you, mm -hmm. but in the next month and a half, that time it gets even more complicated. It's going to be more complicated. I know. I'm already having anxiety about that. It's so, you have to remind everyone, everyone that mainly yourself. Arizona is like the sun, baby. <laughs> we don't, just like the heat of this valley. Yes. We do not move. Right. You, you all you rotate around, around us. Uh huh. So, that's have, a good analogy. We're thank you. I mean, we're a little self centered, but I okay. literally just came up with that. It works. I'm, so glad. Yes. Finally, that coffee is kicking Right. In. Not to throw them under the bus, but my husband has messed up so many business meetings this way. Oh, yeah. Well, we, and, you know, we book things constantly. Yes. And some of these, these things for the morning show is like satellites or Zoom interviews. Mm -hmm. And so I'm constantly, and also with our authors, I say, okay, it's this time East Coast time mm -hmm. and this time in Arizona because also people think that we're on like mountain time when we're not technically mm -hmm. in the same region oh, it's and if you google it the time is different oh. it's it's very complicated so okay. i have to do okay we need to speak to this author at mm -hmm. this time but that'll be arizona time at this time but east coast time yeah. is what it is the so. irony is that we're cocky about the fact that we don't have to um, change the clocks yet we're really bringing more stress upon oh, ourselves above and above <laughs> for, and beyond for a solid six months but i know other states are really really want to do away mm -hmm. with daylight saving mm -hmm. and that would know, be helpful to us it would be helpful yes 
So this, the week that, that we're listening here, we got a new podcast here with Emily and Tommy. You are talking about a book that you've already read that is coming out this week. Yes, out this week is called um, Heard It in a Love Song mm-hmm. by Tracy Garvis Graves. And this is, a, you know, we've talked a lot about how music is involved so much mm-hmm. in some of these books that we've that we've most recently read. And if you see the cover, it it gave me very much like Daisy Jones vibes. Yes. And while I really did like it, and it's a cute little romance about um, a former musician who becomes a, a music teacher, and she goes through a divorce, and then she meets a man who is um, the father of one of her students, mm-hmm. and just their connection and and how music, you know, brings a better side out of her and her journey through that. So it kind of reminded me a little bit about um, the people we keep, mm-hmm. a little Daisy Jones. Mm-hmm. But I needed more music, man. Oh, okay. I, I liked it. I mm-hmm. really enjoyed it. And I think if, you know, for those of us who read romance romance novels, rom-coms, mm-hmm. you know, you know where the you know where it's going. Right. You know what the ending is, usually. It's going to be a happy ending. That's kind of the, like we talked to um, Lauren Lane who was <laughs> right. like, that's kind it's, of the that's the deal. Like right. you gotta write the happy ending. And they call it the H E A. The happily ever after. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. it's like what is that? <laughs> Clear. Okay, so that coffee didn't kick in as much as I thought. So, yeah, I like that's where you know it's going. Yeah. But I could have used a lot more music in between. Mm-hmm. There were some pieces that I really connected with, like, you know, having a, a relationship that doesn't really think that your passion is as important as oh. what happens in their lives. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just. I think that's something that you can relate to. And I think most people can relate to that. Mm-hmm. And it was just, it was a cute rom-com. So I really liked it. Mm-hmm. You liked it, but it didn't change your life. It didn't change my life. But, but that's okay. A lot of rom-coms don't, I mean. Sure. The only rom-com, I mean, it's not even a rom-com. It's like, a, I'm going to ca- call it like a tear-out romance, like mm-hmm. where it just takes you through it. Colleen Hoover, those are the only mm-hmm. romantic, books that really mm-hmm. get you. Mm-hmm. And I'm putting it out there in the universe that I'm going to get her on this podcast. Yes. So. Say it and it will be. She's also hilarious on TikTok. Oh, oh gosh. She's got. This is a, a must. Oh, she's so great. I, yes. So like, the, you know, this rom-com didn't change my life, right. but it was, it was a solid one. Like yeah. it was a good palate cleanser. Um, question, did you ever mm-hmm. look and see if they did maybe a playlist to go with and maybe the music is I elsewhere? didn't. I mean, any book that has a theme of I music know. needs to be jumping on that train. You know, what's funny is that I should have looked that up because um, as we're recording this, uh, just like last week, oh gosh, I'm going to open a can of worms here. <laughs> Rolling Stone uh-huh. released their 500. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. Ugh. She's all eye rolling. She's Big old eye roll. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I don't agree with some of those uh-huh. songs, but I looked up to see if they had a, a Spotify playlist. They didn't. Oh, I was like, come on. Oh, yeah. This is the perfect opportunity. Of course. Couldn't find it. Found the last one that was released, but somebody else had made the, po- the oh, playlist. Yeah. And I thought, major missed opportunity. Well, I started doing it myself, and then I went, this is a lot to look up. Uh-huh. And all of this music, for the most part, I listen to anyway. I'm very mm-hmm. eclectic in my music taste. Mm-hmm. I was like, Rolling Stone, on, you've Rolling missed Stone. an opportunity. So to be fair, I did not look up if a playlist accompanied mm-hmm. this book. But I couldn't imagine not. Right. I'll have to check. Oh, <laughs> I didn't do my homework, my thorough homework. Ugh. Well, you read the book, so that's I what matters. I did read the book. That's well, what matters. Technically, the book was read to me. Same, same. So. Same, same. <laughs> As um, one of my favorite um, you know, swag bags, so to speak. I mean, it's a literal bag <laughs> that um, was at the librarian conference. It said, audiobooks are not cheating. No, they're not. And I said... Thank yes, you. thank you for some <laughs> some confirmation on for that. that validation. The validation was very important, mm-hmm. but you know, without it, but also like with with books like this where mm-hmm. there are lyrics, um, they they speak them to you. Mm-hmm. Some books get like a little bit of musical mm-hmm. or sing it to you. Those ones are almost more awkward. Oh yeah, I mean if <laughs> they're, they're not like a singer, or singing not, the uh-huh. lyrics to you, and you're like. 
maybe don't do that. <laughs> if it's not a fully produced song, I'm not interested. Yeah, like Daisy Jones, I I listened to that as an audio book. Oh, I did not. I read it. And they like they read the lyrics, but mm-hmm. at the the end was end of the book like in past like where the acknowledgments would technically be is where some of the actual lyrics mm-hmm. to the songs that she wrote. But again, they were they were read to you. Okay. Not sung. Mhm. So it's kind of like Right. Which one's better? Right. Oh. Um, and I heard it with a love, heard it in a love song. It is a very cute cover. Oh. And it did actually make me think of the poster from Almost Famous. Yes. It, right. And that's, I think that's probably where it kind of divided for me because I was expecting so much mm-hmm. and a very specific kind of musical mm-hmm. genre with this. Mm-hmm. And so it didn't. It was it was less of the the folk music okay. than I that I expected. Mm-hmm. More of like the Fleetwood Mac era. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the vibe I got mm-hmm. from the cover. Maybe I should have thought it was going to be more like Garden State. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that movie. Although that's one of the best soundtracks. Oh, it's a great soundtrack. So, <laughs> I don't know. I and I think that's just maybe me taking too much from a uh, judging a book by its cover. Literally, right. that's what I was doing, mm-hmm. and that was. Not nice. <laughs> because it was a very lovely story. I just yes. think that I wanted so much more on the music. Okay. Enjoyable but read, though. It's very enjoyable. Yay. A Moment with Margaret. Always a new book to talk about as she churns through them so quickly. So many topics to tackle. Until next time. Mm-hmm. I got to get back to reading. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. We want to hear from you, so send us an email to Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com. Let us know what you're reading and check out the Olivia's Book Club Facebook group. Or you can follow along on Instagram at olivias.bookclub or Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and please tell your friends.